I'm going to tell you the story of Hisashi Aochi. It is extreme, but I tell it with the hope that you will take action in your own death planning, but also to possibly reevaluate your values in terms of love and ethics. There are no jokes in this one, and I'm putting a warning here for the graphic descriptions and images which may distress some viewers. Let's talk the death story of Hisashi Aochi. Hisashi Ochi was born in 1965 and was a native to the Abariachi area. He had a wife, a young son, and a younger sister. He played rugby in high school and was a pack a day smoker. Though he was unqualified for the work, he was hired by JCO as a technician in early 1999. He was 35 years old when this incident occurred. The date was 30th of September, 1999. The location was Tokamura, 130 kilometers northeast of Tokyo, Japan, at the JCO Uranium Nuclear Fuel Plant. This plant served as the first step in producing nuclear reactor fuel rods for Japan's power plants and research reactors. The work requires extreme precision and a specific chemical purification procedure. I will link in the description the complicated process if you're interested. But what you need to know here is that there had been increased pressure placed upon JCO to increase efficiency and this led to the company to employ illegal procedures wherein they skipped several key steps in the enrichment procedure. The technicians poured the product by hand in stainless steel buckets directly into the precipitation tank. This process inadvertently contributed to the triggering of an uncontrolled nuclear chain reaction over the next several hours. The resulting nuclear fusion chain became self-sustaining, emitting intense gamma and neutron radiation. At the time of the event, Hisashi had his body draped over the tank while Shizahara stood on the platform to assist pouring of the solution. Yokokawa was sitting at his desk four meters away. All three technicians observed a blue flash and a gamma radiation alarm sounded. Hisashi and Shinohara immediately experienced pain, nausea and difficulty breathing. Hisashi received the largest radiation exposure, resulting in rapid difficulties with mobility, coherence and loss of consciousness. All three technicians managed to evacuate the building and the emergency services assembled, evacuating the building, the local population, and transporting the technicians to hospital. All three technicians were first taken to the local hospital, then transferred to the National Institute of Radiological Sciences. And finally, his ashi was moved to the University of Tokyo Hospital. His body had absorbed around 17 severhertz of radiation, which has been likened to being at the epicenter of the Hiroshima disaster. It is thought to be the most that anyone has absorbed and not died on the spot. By the time he was taken to Tokyo Hospital, doctors were shocked. He seemed fine. He had somewhat normal skin, it didn't seem visibly burnt, and only his right arm appeared swollen and slightly red. And most importantly, he was fully conscious and able to hold a conversation. It was this lively picture of Hisashi that may explain some of the family and doctor's drastic decisions in the following weeks. Experts now believe that Hisashi was in the walking ghost phase of radiation poisoning and the radiation had completely ruined his chromosomes, meaning that his body no longer had any blueprint from which to reproduce cells. Make no mistake, his skin was irreversibly burnt and his immune system was now non-existent. He was sent to a sterile room in the ICU where he endured countless skin grafts and blood transfusions. A revolutionary approach was suggested that had never been tried on radiation victims before, stem cell transplants. These would, in theory, rapidly restore his body's ability to generate new blood cells. And for a day or so, it appeared to work before his actually returned to his state of near death. Within a few days, the external symptoms really began to show. His skin started to fall off and his lungs filled with fluid, so a breathing tube had to be installed. The gauzes that covered his body had to be changed every day, and this took around three hours and was extremely painful. The bandages that were taken off were weighed to measure how much fluid he lost through his tissue so that it could be given back to him. 
He had multiple skin grafts, but none of them survived due to his lack of immune system. His hair and nails fell out. He could no longer close his eyelids. Blood leaked from his eyes. And an endoscopy showed that the membrane of his intestines had died and was pulling away from the intestinal wall. And this was only the first half of this man's 83 day ordeal. While on one hand, the doctors were doing everything they could to save Azashi, but on the other hand, they really weren't prepared for such a case and thus were throwing every experimental treatment at him. At one point, Hisashi cried out, I can't take it anymore. I'm not a guinea pig. On day 59, Hisashi had his first heart attack, but was revived by doctors as his family wished. From here onward, Hisashi suffered severe brain damage due to three more heart attacks, but was brought back every time. The last heart attack resulted in his heart stopping for a total of 49 minutes and his breathing for over an hour and 35 minutes. Anyone with a bit of medical knowledge knows the outcome of this is never good. Furthermore, his skin and muscles were melting, his organs melting and shutting down, and he had lost his vision. His painkiller medication was no longer working and he was sedated. While his brain waves were somewhat present, his other responses were gone and he had stopped responding to any stimuli, which meant that his cortex had very nearly stopped working and was hanging on by a thread. By now, he was also completely on a ventilator with the breathing machine working for him and his liver and kidney had begun to shut down completely. Finally, 83 days of suffering later, Hisashi succumbed to multiple organ failure in December 21st, 1999. Whether doctors were deliberately using Hisashi for research on the condition they'd never seen before, or whether they were simply trying to keep him alive at the assistance of the family, is not completely understood. And we weren't there. We don't know what their thought process was. But by day 59, there was a distinct change in the medical staff's feeling towards the case. It was said that before this point, they didn't tell the family how hopeless the situation was, but they had also never seen such a case and weren't sure how the treatment process would progress. Thus, when the family said to try everything to save him, they did. But by day 59, after his first heart attack, the team became very aware that his situation was futile. His condition was fatal, and at this point, they were just holding out on the inevitable. At this point, multiple members of the medical staff sat the family down and explained the situation. As expected, the family refused to believe this. After all, when he first arrived at the hospital, he was awake and alert, and the doctors had been telling them up to this point, not that he would be okay, but that there was at least some hope. The medical staff tried again and again in the following days to have the family accept Hisashi's condition or at the very least allow the doctors to let him go at his next inevitable heart attack. The family refused over and over. And at this point, Hisashi was sedated so he couldn't say what he wanted. Thus, the staff resuscitated him again and again. After all this was done, there were reports of medical staff taking leave to deal with suspected PTSD from this case. Now let's talk about the family here. Without question, this is a horrendous experience that no one should have to go through. But I want to be frank about a few points that most videos and articles don't look at in this case. It is completely understandable that when first told that Hisashi's case was futile, that they didn't want to believe it. But that was day 59, and he died on day 83. That's 24 days that they knew the truth. They knew there was a 100% chance of death, that he had no immune system and a huge amount of brain damage. They could see with their own eyes that he had no skin. They knew how much pain he was in. They had heard him screaming for days before he was sedated. He had at points begged to die before he was sedated. They had four chances to let him go naturally by heart attack. They had this entire period to say goodbye and they chose not to. Again, this isn't to blame them and I know they would have said they loved him. But knowing all of that, zero chance to survive, massive amounts of pain, weeks to say goodbye, many chances to let him go and him begging to be let go, 
They insisted he be revived again and again. The old line of, if you love someone enough, you'll let them go. And it's hard to say, but did they love him enough? Not enough to let him rest in peace, and certainly not enough to let him die with any dignity. There is no question that the entity at fault here was the JCO company for not providing adequate safety and training. No question. But right here, right now, we are looking at the how the medical treatment was conducted and how Hisashi died. Because make no mistake, his right to die and his right to die with dignity were taken away from him. If someone is in a horrible car crash, suffers head trauma, third degree burns, drowning and deprivation of oxygen, anything that might put them in a similar situation of being in hospital with virtually no chance of survival, this ordeal could be you. I don't harp on about advanced care planning for nothing. And I know most of you will say, oh, it will never happen to me. But I'm also fairly sure that Hisashi would have said exactly the same thing. If you were killed instantly, this isn't a problem. But 83 days without your opinion being taken into account while enduring excruciating pain, that's a problem. Now, we have a video on advanced care planning, which I'll link below. And it talks about your event care directive, which is a document which outlines your wishes. But just writing this document is not enough if you haven't firmly let your opinions known to your family. If you strongly do not want to be in this position, then tell them outright that you will resent them if you're kept alive in this position. Leave no room for ambiguity with what you want either way. It's good for you and your family. There are many reasons a family may choose to keep their loved one alive while knowing the chances of survival are less than 1%. They believe the individual would want to be kept alive. They believe the individual would be mad at them for allowing them to die. They fear the guilt of letting them go. Or there are more selfish reasons. They would feel sad that the person died. They would feel grief. Or even worse, the dying person was the breadwinner of the family. There are so many reasons, but when survival is less than 1%, you are simply putting off the inevitable and letting your loved ones suffer. I know the media is full of, I survived against the odd kind of stories, and it makes you think that doctors can make miracles happen, but sometimes they just can't. That is reality. Listen to what they are saying to you. Go with your brain and not your heart. Is it difficult? Absolutely, no question. My family has been there. But if the doctors are saying there is nothing more they can do, think of your loved one's suffering first, not your own grief. Come on out of denial. Before we go, I'm aware that different religions and cultures have various views on this. We spoke about this in depth in our What is Death video. Not being part of these cultures, I don't know how much comfort these beliefs may give in the time of suffering of this individual or their families in this kind of situation where there's so much stomach churning suffering in front of them. Maybe it is helpful. If you are part of one of these religions or cultures and have been in this situation, I would really love to know how these two elements came together to work. Also, as a side note, that infamous picture on the web that comes up when you Google Hisashi's name, that's not actually him. It's a 16 year old third degree burn victim from Texas, which is why we didn't show the picture. Okay, it's been a tough video, so thank you for watching. And if you found it interesting, please give us a like and consider subscribing. Now go talk death.